Hey guys, welcome back to CRT Rejuvenation Repair Testing Tips. I think this will be the final installment, at least for a while, because I'm running out of things to try and to uh, talk about. So, when I left off, I was frustrated in trying to resurrect this unmarked, unknown 10-inch CRT um, uh, a few things uh, following up on your comments. Um, as far as I know, looking at test data and whatnot, there were really only two 10 inch CRTs with a 12 pin base the 10AB and the 10AD P4. Uh, basically, all 12 inch CRT bases have the same pinout. I can also very clearly see the leads going down to the elements, so I'm certain I have this hooked up right. Even so, I've tried flipping G1 and G2 and K. The filaments obviously are right because the filament glows. <sighs> so, we have absolutely zero emissions. Um, so, what could be the cause of it? In the past, when I've seen that, it's been an open cathode. Now, these CRTs were used in portable TVs. And I included a clip I took some years ago in my old apartment when I had the same CRT, well, what I presume is the same CRT type, also open cathode, I was able to re-weld it. These portable sets got knocked around and then beat up, and I think that's why they would get uh, the guns damaged or the cathodes opening up just from um, being abused. Uh, but I haven't had any luck re-welding this using the techniques I've used in the past, which is to run it filament at elevated temperature, put it on removed G1 short, and tap the, the neck. Um, I want you mention that um, it should be heated for 30 seconds or more. I didn't heat it up that long, so we're going to try heating it up longer. Um, I cannot physically see any damage. I don't know that it's an open cathode. So what else could cause absolutely zero emissions? Um, if some air is leaked in, because there's no, there's no getter, or the getter's been used up, which has me concerned. Now, if a lot of air got inside, the filament wouldn't glow. Uh, and if some air leaked in, it should ionize and we should see a purple bluish glow and we don't. What I don't know is, if a little bit of air leaks in, is it possible that it would completely kill emissions, we wouldn't see any ionized gas, and the filament would still glow orange? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> in which case I'm completely wasting my time and it doesn't have an open cathode. But we're going to assume it does. And there's one more, uh, we're gonna, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to heat it up longer. We're going to try the same thing with the G1 and hold down the red button. But instead of me tapping the neck, we're going to use this guy. I've forgotten about this. Um, I picked up a Raytronic Beamer cathode uh, restorer a while ago. That was, I think, the first device like this that ever came on the market. And it was <laughs> a hodgepodge. So there's the core device itself, and it came with this, um, which is uh, just an off-the-shelf uh, personal vibrator um, massager. Uh, mine didn't come with it, but I just bought this off eBay, but it looks identical to the one that would have come with the device. And the other thing it would have come with was a high-voltage, high-frequency device, um, a BD-10, which is made by Wall, I th not Wall, um, I forget who makes them, but it's still made to this day, you can still buy them. But they sell for a few hundred bucks, and I'm missing it. I probably wouldn't help this, I think it can help with removing shorts, um, but we have the opposite problem. So the idea is, instead of me whacking the neck, we're going to put this up against the neck. Uh, they showed this attachment being used in the literature, so that's what we'll go with. It's kind of hard, not kind of, it is hard plastic. So I'm a little concerned, but uh, it's not metal, so that should help. Let's see, I guess let's, let's throw it on like so. Okay, so let's turn this on. Man. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to put it against another CRT just to get a feel for it. Okay, that's, that's kind of insane. <laughs> Uh, oh, did you see that? Did you see that? That was a flash. Holy cow. This would be amazing if that worked. Oh, come on. 
It flashed. Something flashed. But we still have no emissions. Ah. Oh. Well, we can try it again. Maybe it opened back up. At least it did something. <laughs> I also turned the bias all the way down, so I'm... Um, Actually, it's, the grid is more positive than it's supposed to be right now. Just thinking that might coax some emissions out of it. Okay, we shall try it again. This has a circuit breaker in it. Occasionally when you go to these more aggressive settings, it trips it. So that's all that that was. All right, we wait 30 seconds again. Okay, here we go again. We got another spark. It was kind of down here. So I'm wondering if I'm actually vibrating the grid loose and it's shorting into something, but hey, it's not like we have anything to lose. I'm thinking I gotta move faster too. I'm gonna go from uh, heating this up to vibrating it. It's tough that you have to rotate the switch like six positions. And if I go too fast, it'll trip the circuit breaker. Nope. All right. Make sure everything's still fully connected. And uh, keep going. Let's see, trip the, trip the circuit breaker. Well, I'm just going to keep at it. I think you get the idea. Um, ideally, we see a flash, and then when I switch it back to check emissions, we get emissions. So just keep going at it. Well, I'm calling it quits <laughs> after. Uh, about 40 attempts, 40 sparks, um, nothing. Also, I started noticing that occasionally the spark would happen down inside this barrel, but mostly it was sparking, arcing out here between, I think, the cathode and one of the filament leads. So it wasn't even getting down in here, it was arcing between two of the, two of the lead-in elements. Uh, now I can't get a spark at all anymore. Uh, the last five attempts, no spark, so uh, I'm still starting to get more and more paranoid about this neck breaking. <laughs> so we're going to move on. I'll tell you what though, I'm going to hang on to this, and if I ever get my Midwest Raytronic Beamer restored and working, that has some more brutal um, voltages it can deliver, so we can try it with that maybe. Uh, but yeah, it's a little, little disappointing. Um, to say the least. Uh, so let's move on. Well, that was a bit disappointing. I haven't 100% given up yet, but I'm going to move on for now. <laughs> let's do something a little different and talk about what to do with a loose base. Super common problem. First off, when you get a uh, TV or thinking about getting a TV and you want to test the CRT, be careful. I've seen this happen again and again and again. Where a guy's going to test the CRT and they pull the plug off the base, uh, the socket off the base, and they just rip the, the base right off the CRT. It's really common for these to be loose. They used a special bonding agent between the base, which is typically Bakelite, and the glass. Um, over time, from heat uh, cycles, the, the adhesion um, breaks. Uh, there are plenty of ways to repair it. I'm sure you all have your favorites. I think I've heard them all from wood glue, super glue, epoxy, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm just going to show you what I like to use, and I'll tell you why I like to use it which is this. Permatex windshield and glass sealant. I'll give you a few reasons. One, um, it bonds really well to both uh, substances. It has a little bit of give and it doesn't have any acetic acid. It's a type of silicone adhesive but your standard silicone adhesive has acetic acid in it. It's that nasty smell that can corrode copper. Now I do not have any definitive proof that using that will cause the wires inside here to corrode all the way through. 
I don't know, but this is really very readily available at any auto parts store. It's inexpensive, so why take a chance? Now this is the ideal situation where it's still attached and there's only a little bit of give. Meaning that the bonding agent, the old stuff, is still in here. And uh, there's, so there's just a fine gap between that and the glass. So all I need to do is clean this up a little bit. And uh, notice the flowable part of this. Uh, at least I think, yeah, <laughs> flowable silicon. This is fairly uh, thin. This will flow into that gap and set up uh, fairly quickly, maybe an hour or so to the point where it is, uh, yes, <laughs> let dry for one hour. Full cure, 24, but within an hour, it's, it's going to basically not be, you, you won't be able to move it. Now, the other reason I like this is it has some give to it. These get pretty hot when they're running. The gas will, uh, sorry, the glass will expand a little bit. The base ideally expands exactly the same amount, but I don't think that's always the case, and that's probably why this adhesion fails over time. If you use a super rigid glue, like two-part epoxy, you might crack the glass eventually, or crack the base. Uh, plus, if, if for whatever reason you ever need to remove it, that will be really hard to get off. This has give, so it'll be no problem with thermal cycling. I think you could get it off, if, even if just using a razor blade, you had to go around and break the seal for some reason. Uh, you'd be able to. Super glue will fail with heat. Uh, wood glue, Elmer's glue, I think eventually would probably fail as well. Um, those are the most common types of uh, adhesives I've heard used. It also means we need to think about how we want to apply it. The first thing I want to do is clean this thing, because this thing is filthy. This is a metal cone CRT. Crazy how light they are. About half the weight of a glass CRT. Uh, and this is also basically irreplaceable, so I want to be very careful with it. So I'm going to clean this off with Windex, paper towels, and then uh, I want to flow some adhesive into it. Now, I can't do it with it face down because it will run out. It's not thin like water, but it's fairly thin. So what I want to do is do it like so, or a bit of an angle, and then I'm going to put it into this roll of paper towels while it sets up. Like so. I'll put a little bit of bracing so it doesn't fall over. <laughs> Uh, it takes about an hour to set up and fully cures in 24 hours. So I will apply the adhesive tonight and just let it sit unmolested until tomorrow night. And then we'll take a look at it. Oops. Um, so I'm going to get some Windex, uh, just generic glass cleaner and paper towels and wipe this whole thing down. As it has got decades of filth on it. That's a lot better. Uh, and I discovered this is a rebuild while I was cleaning it. There's a seam right here. Interesting metal that they make these out of too. They call it spun steel. There's a... Uh, oh, it almost looks like 3D... Like it was 3D printed. <laughs> I really don't know how these are manufactured, but um, this is made up of ridges. Like it was built up in layers. All right, so let's let's glue this sucker up. Uh, just open up the package. This comes in a tube, and you need to uh, break the seal and screw this onto it. I've had trouble with these drying out once I open them up. Well, seal it as best I can. All right, so I just made a small hole in it. I'm not gonna need very much, so I'm gonna keep all the openings small. And, uh, Put a little notch in this, just like with cock. So, like so, that'll, that'll do. Let's squeeze this out. See, just coming up to the tip. Alrighty, so, let's, uh, oh, sorry, I was bumping into the camera tripod. Let's uh, put this uh, angle here. I had one 
pitcher tube rebuilt ever before the last rebuilder shut down. And this is uh, basically what he used, as near as I can tell. Because uh, the base on the rebuilt CRT is the same type of give and appearance that this will have. This dries clear, by the way. Alright, so. Put that in our little makeshift stand here. And check on it in a little bit. Kind of convenient that it works out to be just the right diameter. Here it is the next day. Let's see how I did. Well, I could have been a little neater cleaning out the excess, but I did avoid having it on so thick it protrudes. That's the thing you really want to avoid. If this adhesive sticks out, you may have trouble sliding on the ion trap magnet, the focus coil, the yoke. You want to keep this so it's flush with uh, the other components. As far as adhesion goes, perfect. It's on there very firmly, but if you put enough pressure, there's a little bit of give to it. Exactly what I was going for. Well, moving on now, let's uh, try experimenting with brightener. So here is a Predict Television with an original low voltage uh, type CRT. And the set is actually playing right now with the brightness turned up all the way. Maybe you can just barely make something out. Let me turn off the lights. <laughs> hey, there's actually an image there. I put this on my tester with the recommended uh, filament voltage of 2.35 volts. The emissions are like two ticks above zero. I tried doing the manual restore, the, the sorry, the auto restore, then a one shot rejuve. It actually made things a little bit worse. However, I noticed when I turned the filament juice up to about three and a half, four volts, the emissions went up way into the green. So, let's see what a brightener can do. So this is, it's a little bit brighter than, well no, this is about what normal, a well lit living room would be about at this level, so obviously you couldn't watch this unless you sat in complete darkness. So, here is my brightener. Perma power. this is the right type, I believe, of uh, socket for this set. There's a switch on the back, S and P. Series strong sets, we want this in the S position. This I'll try to fit in the housing here. If I need to, I'll just leave the back off. This will increase the filament juice. How much? I don't know. I'm guessing in the order of 25%, just like when I did on my tester, which got about a 75% boost in the emissions. So, let's see. Now, on the, in the contrast, uh, the cutoff one improved dramatically as well. So, let's see what effect it has. Okay, it has been installed. It looks like the film is glowing a little bit brighter than it did earlier. Waiting for the set to warm up. <laughs> well, yeah, that's an improvement. We couldn't see it, or we could barely see it before with the lights on. Lights off again. It's not spectacular though. Yeah, it's better. There's brightness all the way up. It's better, it's not like... like new. So again, with the lights on, eh. No, this would not be the greatest viewing experience, but it is brighter than it was. But, uh, yeah, so yes, a brightener will brighten the picture. Um, it works as advertised. Not as much as I would have liked. I um, mean, as we'll see in a, in a bit um, tomorrow, I'll, uh, install a new picture tube so remember how that looks <laughs> remember that looks with the uh, this on uh, hopefully my camera won't be auto compensating too much and we can do a fair comparison uh, I would not enjoy watching that in a brightly lit room uh, but it is better how long it would last I don't know could last an hour could last a year I don't know
I don't think any, I mean, from all the anecdotal evidence I've heard from old servicemen and, and such and uh, servicing articles, nobody could ever say it was always a gamble. But it was a quick fix. If you went to a customer's house, doing a house call, you could pop one of these on in 10 minutes, charge them 25 bucks, be on your way, and they could have a, a, a more pleasant viewing experience for a while. Well, they saved up to buy a new picture tube. Well, in this box is a 21 CQP4 that I picked up at the TV convention last month. Notice the base. It kind of looks like an octal tube base, except the keyway is a little bit fatter. This is that intermediate base type. Luckily, the neck is the same diameter. Uh, an inch and one-eighth, I do believe. And this is the same as the 8YP4 test CRT. And I've put some predicted yokes onto that little test CRT. Sometimes it can get hung up on this big light base. The later tubes, they just dispense with this base altogether, and the pins just come right through the glass, just like a miniature tube. So there is, this doesn't even exist in later generations. Now, if you go by the specs, this picture tube should not fit inside the housing. However, this is a rebuild. I bought several rebuilds, and when they rebuild it, they cut the glass here, and they insert a new electron gun, glass stem, base, they evacuate it and reseal it, and, and all that. The length on the rebuilds can vary quite a bit. Uh, between the three I bought, one is about what it should be, according to the specs. One is a little bit longer, and this one is considerably shorter. Between the three, the length of the neck varies by almost two inches, which is crazy. But uh, this one, I eyeballed it that a test fit with the back cover. It should just fit. However, I uh, need to make an adapter or rewire it or something because my uh, socket's not going to fit onto this base. Now, because it's used for a short period of time, this base can be kind of hard to find. I don't know if I have any. I need to dig around. I think I might have an adapter for use with the 8YP4 test CRT, which also has his base on it. But as far as a permanent uh, solution, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I'm going to do right now. But I think with the help of an adapter, at least I can install this and we can power it up and check out how it looks. It should be considerably brighter. And there we go. Just had to switch G1 and G2. I traced out the wiring and made the change in this connector. So here it is running with that same test pattern with the shoot very bright shop light right above it shining down on it. Perfectly watchable. I can even go a little bit higher with the brightness if I want. If I normally have it around here. Very responsive with the contrast control and much better focus. So this was absolutely a success. And I expect this to be <laughs> the way of the future, certainly with more popular sets where substitutions have to be made for picture tubes and modifications when necessary. Uh, most CRTs, 90% of these vintage black and white type, are going to be 6.3 volt, 600 milliamp filaments. But some sets, like the predictors, use oddball 2.35, 2.68. There are also 8.4 volt uh, out there for portables in Europe. 12.6 uh, is uh, standard, I do believe. Uh, and dimensions and yokes and, and all that. Um, so, for example, 21 inch, 110 degree are in high demand because of predictors and similar sets, GE coaxials, same type CRT. However, there is a glut of 19 inch, 114 uh, black and white CRTs. They were the standard in portables throughout the 60s. I've got a few. I've turned down a bunch. I've seen them go on sold on eBay. I thought about using one if I could not get one in a Predicta. So, a 19 in place of a 21. There'd be a one inch border around. Okay, pack some foam in or something. Um... And 114 versus 110, probably close enough, wouldn't be any big deal. Uh, so, 
<laughs> someday maybe if these uh, picture tube uh, rebuilders never get uh, back up and running maybe that's what we'll have to start doing uh, but for now uh, yeah this this was a success and here it is with some actual program material uh, this looks fantastic it's been a while since I saw what a <laughs> new old stock or rebuilt picture tube looks like that is that is fantastic uh, so that's that's, that's going to be a wrap for now. I was not able to resurrect this <laughs> on Mark CRT, unfortunately. I'm really thinking it's not an open cathode, though. There's something else going on. The, the gun is physically damaged. All the coating has gone off the cathode, or enough air is leaked in that it just does not work anymore. But I will keep banging away on it, literally and figuratively. Uh, talked about reattaching bases, and... Uh, swapping out CRTs and using a brightener. So I hope you enjoyed these tips, found this interesting, found this useful. Thanks for watching.